Good morning and welcome to a virtual town hall hosted by your 23rd district legislators. This morning you'll be hearing from Senator Christine Rolfus and Representatives Drew Hansen and Tara Simmons. Some of you have submitted questions in advance and we will relay those questions to the lawmakers. You may also submit your question live in the comments section of the platform you're watching on. We are streaming this via Zoom, but also on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. We'll be taking questions from all platforms. Uh, so if your question doesn't jump, jump to the top of the queue, please know that we are taking them from multiple sources. Submit your questions now, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Before we get started with questions, the lawmakers will give some brief opening remarks. Senator Rolfes, if you'd like to get us started. Thank you, Peter. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us at our first online town hall. We usually do these in person a uh, couple of places around the county or in the middle of our legislative session. Um, but I really appreciate folks showing up and we'll do the best we can to answer questions. I'm State Senator Christine Rolfus. I have been representing you in the State Senate since I was appointed to the seat in 2011. And then um, I, so I've been representing you ever since. The um, I am currently in the, I am currently the chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, and I serve on the Natural Resources, Agriculture and Parks Committee as well. So my primary responsibilities in the legislature when we're in session is working with the Senate members to produce and um, eventually pass a balanced budget that represents the values of the entire state. And then uh, secondarily, I focus on natural resource and environmental issues through the committee that I serve on. I have, I am working a couple of bills this year that originated in our district that are not relevant to either of those committees. And um, one of them is helping solve a tax exemption problem related to farmers markets that are located in church parking lots. It's, uh, um, I, as I said in the Senate, churches, farmers markets, what's not to like, we need to pass the bill so the farmers markets can continue to be hosted in church parking lots. Um, simple bill, I'm hoping the, the house will pass it quickly. And then the second bill from the district that I'm working on is one that embeds arts education into our public school system. That passed through the Senate last week and it's being heard in the House right now. And it essentially makes sure that arts education is considered part of basic education, just like math and civics and uh, handwriting. The, um, it's just important to the economy of the state and it's important to children's mental health. So I'm hoping that the House will see the importance of, of uh, emphasizing the importance of the arts in our public schools. And then I have a myriad of other bills that I'm working on, mostly related to the budget. Um, as a budget writer, it's my responsibility to pass through those kinds of bills. So I'm going to close my remarks. It is my honor to serve all of you, and I look forward to hearing what's on your mind. Do I go now, Peter? Yes, please. Okay, uh, I'm Drew Hansen. I'm in the House of Representatives. Uh, as Senator Rolfa said, we haven't done one of these for a bit. We always do them in person. And then last fall, we did some ferry oriented town halls with this format. And because that was what was on everyone's mind, including ours. Uh, so that format worked well enough that we're, we're doing it this way. God willing, we'll be back in person uh, real soon. Typically, as some of you know, I've worked on access to college and job training in Kitsap County. So at Olympic College, we now have degree programs in electrical engineering with WSU, cybersecurity with Western Washington University, and early childhood education with Western Washington University because of initiatives that I pushed forward a few years ago. So you can get full college degrees in partnership with these universities while staying in Kitsap County. And so I think with everyone, things switched in 2020. We all spent a long time just trying to figure out how we were going to deal with the pandemic uh, from March 2020 forward. We were in, I mean, 2020 was probably daily touch with the governor's staff, the hospital association, people from the Department of Health. And that continued and uh, really up to the present day, not quite as frequent, but, you know, giving our views to the governor on how we do this. I mean, here, like one example was when we were, remember when we did phase one and phase two, there's kind of that sequence. When that first rolled out, there wasn't any provision. It was like a uniform statewide standard. There wasn't any recognition that King County, which is very dense and at that point had high 
high infection rates is a different place than Kitsap County, and you probably need different metrics for reopening. So some of us uh, raised that pretty loudly to the governor, and a week or two later, we saw some regional flexibility in those metrics. So that's the kind of thing you know we spent a lot of time occupying ourselves with. I also then last year uh, spent a lot of time working on public broadband. It was illegal until last year for Kitsap PUD to offer you broadband direct to the customer the way they offer you sewer uh, or water. Uh, that is preposterous. Uh, thanks to my bill, the Public Broadband Act, that is no longer the law. And I got to credit Senator Rolfus, who just bulldozed that through the Senate um, against sharp opposition from the cable companies. Who, boy, did they not like that bill? But, you know, that is the beginning of having public broadband options throughout the state, just like we have public power public water and public sewer. And third and finally, you know, just part of the pandemic switch is now thinking, okay, how do we how do we help more people with the cost of college and job training? We're seeing lower enrollments, particularly at community colleges, because it's just a lot, right? It's a lot to deal with going to college. And a bill that I'm excited about, which I'm very much hopeful is going to pass, would make public colleges, so Olympic College, WSU, UW, tuition free for families making 70 grand a year or less for a family of four. So that's, you know, that's a working family, right? You're not totally, totally poor, but man, you sure aren't rich. And getting some help with the cost of college, I think would be a big thing we can do as a state to help people get back on their feet. So thank you for listening. I look forward to hearing from Vice Chair Simmons. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Chair Hansen and Senator Rolfes. Uh, and everyone who's joined today, this is my very first town hall. I'm the newest member of the 23rd LD delegation, and it's been a challenge to learn my job in a virtual session. I have never um, spoken on the House floor yet or been able to be in my office, which is, um, you know, definitely created some barriers in learning the actual job to be an effective legislator. However, I have had some success in passing 50% of my bills so far. Um, my, I am on the um, Public Safety Committee. I'm the Vice Chair to Chair Hansen on the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee, and I'm also on the Health Care Committee. And those things fit me well because of my history as being a registered nurse for 11 years and caring deeply about healthcare access for everybody. And then uh, now as a civil rights attorney um, and somebody who has lived experience in the criminal justice system, really trying to make sure that we are preventing recidivism and um, creating a safe community for all. So those are the areas that I've been focusing on. Last year, I was able to restore the rights to vote for people who have been incarcerated as a way to welcome them back into our communities and um, hopefully prevent recidivism. Also um, passed a bill around behavioral health um, ombudsman office and making sure that our behavioral health system is strengthened and um, finding deficiencies that we need to continue to work on to strengthen um, behavioral health access across our community, which I know is very much tied to um, public safety issues. Um, also this year, I, um, my charity care bill is making its way through the Senate now that will provide more affordable health care for people in our district who utilize our only hospital, um, St. Michael's, um, and unfortunately sometimes have a high deductible on their insurance uh, and end up with huge bills that they can't afford because they are struggling to make ends meet. Um, so those are some of the things I'm working on and I'm also fighting for um, uh, and thankfully learning so much from my colleagues here, Senator Rolfes and Representative Hansen on how to um, provide critical investments for our district through the budget process. And we've, we've been a good team and I, I'm excited next week, the operating budget and the capital budget will be released. And I, and I hope we have a lot of investments for our community. So that's me and I'm grateful to serve you, honored to serve you and happy that we're having our first town hall. Although I wish it was in person, I'm looking forward to the day we can be in person again. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let's dive into the questions. Our first question comes to us from Sharon. Is there any plan to lower property taxes for those of us who are on a fixed income? Our property taxes go up every year, but our income remains stagnant. We have challenged our tax assessment, but we're denied the request because our social security and small retirement account puts us just over the maximum earning category for tax relief. This is not a sustainable situation for retired individuals. I can I can take that and I, maybe the way we should do this is one of us will answer and then the others can chime in if we missed anything. So here is what I can tell you about property taxes. We know property taxes are um, 
are unfair, essentially, you are taxed not based on your ability to pay. In our state, we don't have an income tax system. So what we have are property taxes, business and occupation taxes, and sales taxes that support our, our local and state governments. The um, good news on property taxes is that this is the first year, the 2022, when we get our, well, we all got our Valentine's Day cards from Meredith Green um, last week. It's the first year that the 1% cap is going back on property tax collections. So for the last few years, the property tax from the state has been rate based. So as your property value went higher, your assessment went higher your taxes went up based on a rate. They're now going to be capped statewide at not growing more than 1%. So a lot of people will see their property taxes stay flat and some people um, will see them go down while others see them go up, but the, the um, uh, adjustments won't be as dramatic as they have been. So that's, I think, good news for a lot of people. We also changed, uh, the property tax exemption. And it sounds like um, the person that asked the question won't qualify because their income is too high. Um, but we changed it a couple of years ago so that low income seniors living on in Kitsap County, it's $48,000 a year or less can apply for the property tax relief program. So for folks that fall into that category of 48 or less, there's some, some um, help on that. And disabled veterans, regardless of age, also qualify for similar um, property tax reductions. So that's what I that's what I can say about that right now. Yeah, we'll try, and just like Senator Rolfa said, we're going to try to kick through as many questions as possible, right? So we're not all going to chime in on probably most of these. So you know, we we also have opinions. But we want to get to your questions, so that's where we'll go now. Unless Vice Chair Simmons. Has Our next question is from Walt. Will the proposed transportation funding that we've heard about include funding for safe to schools projects? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, I don't remember the number, but I'm reasonably certain it does. Good question. Next question. Our, our next question is from Mark. Do you support the cap, capital budget for the hybrid electric ferries and upgrade electrification at all three terminals? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no question, right? I mean, it's in the transportation package. It's a it's a big thing on ferries, so that we totally need to do that. Excellent. Our next question um, comes from Jeff. Um, Kitsap County is in the midst of an outrageous crime wave. I feel this is the direct result of legislating legislation limiting law enforcement intervention, decriminalizing drug possession, and other crimes. Um, what will you do to reverse the policies that clearly put the ordinary citizens of Kitsap County in harm's way from unprosecuted criminals? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I, I just want to first start by saying it was the Supreme Court that struck down the drug felony possession statute um, and finding that it was unconstitutional in a case for um, state versus Blake. And had the legislature not interceded, that would be the law of the land. So last year we um, recriminalized drug possession and made it a misdemeanor. Um, and also in that bill created $80 million of um, behavioral health investments to help um, treat the root cause of um, drug crime, which is substance use disorder. And now we are implementing uh, those funds throughout our county. In fact, we have new positions that have been created here in Kitsap County of community-based outreach workers who will go into encampments and provide um, opportunity for people to get straight into detox and provide wraparound services for people to um, get into treatment and then into um, supportive housing. So we are making progress uh, and that, and re, you know, through that Blake bill, um, we got those resources. Um, in addition, I would say that the police reforms that we did were, you know, listening to the people who passed initiative 940 and um, to our community who had concerns about police accountability and transparency. The, the laws that we passed last session, we, after we've listened to all stakeholders, law enforcement, community, um, recognize that there are a couple of tweaks that needed to be made and some clarification around what those laws did and didn't do. Um, after the bills were passed, 
we, um, you know, there was a lot of questions with legal counsel around what police can and cannot do. And so some of the bills that we passed already this session off of the House floor were clarifying that police can interfere or intervene with behavioral health issues, with um, child custody um, removals and, and things like that. We also clarified um, what weapons they can use around um, 50 caliber um, guns and making sure that they have access to that when needed. And the last thing that we recently did that did not have complete 100% support was clarifying that they can use reasonable force when there's reasonable suspicion that somebody has committed a crime or is about to commit a crime. You know, this was hard because it wasn't universal support to return this tool back to our police officers. But I think that our delegation did a very thoughtful consideration of that policy and recognized that we still have protections and safeguards. Police still, de-escalation is still the primary goal. They cannot use excessive force, but reasonable force to detain somebody who's fleeing from an investigatory um, stop is necessary for them to do their jobs. And so we we returned that so far in, in House Bill 2037, which is now making its way through the Senate. I'm very proud of the work that our delegation is doing to be very thoughtful in these considerations and balancing the needs of some of our most marginalized community members who have not always had positive experiences with police officers and also supporting our police officers who have a really hard job to do. Our next question. Uh, Peter, can I, add, can I add something to that? Because there were a couple of questions coming at us related to that. Um, and one of the questions is, do we support those bills? And the answer is yes. We, all three of us have voted for those bills as they've been coming through the legislature this year. The um, other thing that I want to add is the issue of property crime, uh, particularly in North Kitsap, because we've been hearing a lot about that from um, folks in the Polsbo area. And part of what we're seeing is the kind of the COVID backlog that's statewide in terms of processing court cases and having jails be able to keep people at capacity when they need to spread them out due to COVID. And so there's been a backlog in um, essentially in prosecutions and in um, keeping people in jail. So there, I know there is, anyway, we've been getting some information about, about people being released early, people not being booked, and that's something at the county level that they're working through. And as Omicron becomes less of an issue, it's hoped that the whole system will start to work the way it was intended to work. Excellent. Our next question uh, comes from Ron. House Bill 1782 would eliminate single family housing zones in cities and impose, impose minimum housing density. Please explain your positions on the imposition of housing densities by the state legislature on local jurisdictions. I'll, I'll take that one um, because I was one of the people who co-sponsored that bill. Um, you know, I received a lot of education um, throughout the um, process. The, first of all, I'll just say that the bill is not was not voted off the House floor, and it did um, it died um, by the cutoff, and the Senate vehicle did not move either. So this will not be an issue this session. However, I just want to explain, you know, what led to my reasoning to, to co-sponsor the bill. A lot of times we co-sponsor bills. We, it might not be a perfect bill, but we want to raise the conversation. And we did raise the conversation and I learned a lot through the process, particularly how that bill would have impacted islands. And we were able to um, make sure before it was going to be brought to the house floor that um, Bainbridge Island was excluded um, because you live on a sole aquifer and, and couldn't tolerate um, the increase in development there. Um, I do think we have an affordable housing crisis and we need to look at a lot of different solutions to fix our affordable housing crisis and having um, duplexes and triplexes and, um, and fourplexes uh, near transit in highly populated um, places might be a solution. And, and so, you know, um, Governor Jay Inslee is the person who uh, 
requested this bill and he's our constituent as well. So when he asked, I said, yes, I will co-sponsor this bill and start the conversation. And I think we learned a lot throughout it. And that is uh, a lot of places don't want this um, policy. And, and so that's probably what led to its demise. Um, I think we, we need to have uh, thoughtful conversations. And as I'm not a, a planning um, expert, it definitely was a great learning experience for me. And I think we need to continue the conversations around how to increase supply so we can decrease prices for all, all people. Yeah, and I'll jump in on that one because I totally agree with what Vice Chair Simmons just said. Like, we do need more housing, like market rate housing, not just government subsidized affordable housing. And the way to do that is in areas that are already zoned to density. We can debate about what the mechanism is, but one thing that we pushed forward in the House this year is making it easier to construct ADUs or the what used to be called mother-in-law or father-in-law apartments. So, you know, something on top of your garage or something, making that easier to do. That is a great rental solution, also a great intergenerational housing solution. So that was one thing that made it across the House for last week that we were happy to support and look forward to seeing more along those lines. Excellent. Our next question comes to us from YouTuber Yum Yum Devil. I sustained a repetitive motion injury at work, raising and lowering lunch tables daily. Do you support House Bill 1837? We do. I can take that one unless Vice Chair Simmons does. That's a House bill. That, that, that relates to musculoskeletal injuries. Okay, So all that bill does is it repeals about a 20-year-old prohibition on the Department of Labor and Industries even considering whether you can get repetitive stress injuries from, you know, from motion at work. You can see why you might want the Department of Labor and Industries to be able to consider that question and consider what rules might be appropriate, whether that's people working in fields doing repetitive motion in a particular way, whether that's people in healthcare, I mean, whatever it is, right? So that's all that does. It doesn't create any rules. It just removes a restriction on labor and industries from considering that. I was happy to support that. For some reason, that took us until six, 27 in the morning to debate all night to get that bill passed. So look forward to seeing that bill pass the Senate and get to the governor's desk. Excellent. Our next question comes from Natalie. As a longtime adjunct math professor at several community colleges and the part-time faculty president of AFT Seattle, the Faculty Union for Seattle Colleges, I've been watching and advocating for bills that strengthen our enrollments and address issues that will both benefit part-time faculty and public service workers. One of these is Senate Bill 5847 that deals with the public loan forgiveness question. Do you support Senate Bill 7, Senate Bill 5847? Um, and what else have you done to help make college more affordable? So I can't speak to the Senate bill since we haven't seen that one yet, and I don't know if it's moved. I mean, obviously, at the federal level, there's public service loan forgiveness that has recently been simplified. And so you're seeing people get their loans forgiven. Given that federal program, it's not clear what we would do at the state level to add on to that, particularly because most loans are federal. Generally, what you know, what I focused on, as I mentioned at the, at the jump, was both expanding direct opportunities. So new programs like electrical engineering, cyber at Olympic College and then affordability, so making it easier for more families to afford it. And also, I think, you know, part three, faculty pay. So we have this huge problem with nursing faculty, and thank you for, you know, your, your service as a teacher, where, like, you know, a nurse can go make a lot more at Harborview than they could teaching nursing at community college. And no surprise, we couldn't get enough people to fill those nursing faculty positions. And so year after year, we couldn't take people into the nursing program. It made me berserk. And so in one of my bills a couple of years ago, we put a chunk of money into increasing, fa increasing faculty pay for nursing and then for other high demand fields. So areas where you can go make as much or more in the private sector as you could teaching. So welding, IT, the various other healthcare fields, and lo and behold, I mean, when I check in with our community college presidents, it's working. When you offer people pay that's competitive, they'll actually take the job. And so we are finally able to get nursing students enrolled into the nursing program. And boy, oh boy, it was good that we did that before the pandemic hit. So I don't know if y'all read the Kitsap Sun, OC nursing students were coming out deployed into the community, doing tests, doing vaccinations, like helping people. Thank God we expanded nursing capacity, right? So now that... It, 
interestingly, there's another bottleneck now related to clinical rotations in the community. We're going to be doing some work on that in the budget, but that's the next frontier. Like, I th- we need to keep an eye on faculty pay, making sure we're competitive, but we are able to take full cohorts of nursing students now uh, because we have enough faculty. I mean, for the first time that I can remember in the last 10 years. So that's super exciting. Look forward to building on that. And I hate to take the energy level down a notch, um, but I want to I want to add um, specifically to the um, the question that was asked about a specific Senate bill 5647. Just a heads up for Tara and Drew, it's a really common sense piece of legislation that helps it um, embeds within state government people who can do the work needed for um, state employees and people and our contractors, but people working in public service to know about the loan forgiveness program and help do the paperwork for the loan forgiveness program. And that is in direct response to a federal law that allows people if they have been paying off their student loans for 10 years, 120 months, and they have met a criteria of number of years working for the public in public service, they can get their loan forgiven. And the hope is that, you know, the big surge in the next couple of years of making sure all state employees and state employment contractors, the nonprofits that provide services are aware of the program. They have the paperwork that certifies their employment and we help them move on because that is a raise for people if we can do that. No, that, thank you, Senator. That's great, right? It doesn't cost the state any money and helps us take advantage of federal programs. Like, we definitely support that. So look forward to supporting that as it goes. As a person who has $300,000 in student loans, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Our next uh, question is um, for all of you from Kelly. When deciding whether or not to sponsor, co-sponsor, or support a bill, what factors do you consider? Do you reach out to the constituents and communities affected, or do you rely on lobbyists, advocates, and supporters who call, email, and testify or sign it on bills? I'll go ahead and answer that. I tend to co-sponsor a lot of bills, uh, but probably a lot more than b- both of my colleagues here. Uh, probably, you know, I usually co-sponsor after I read it and think it's a good idea to raise a conversation. Not that it's perfect, but if it speaks to my values, uh, if I know the sponsor of the bill and know their values, then I will probably sign on to start the conversation just as a sign of support. Um, as the process goes along, I definitely try to reach out to impacted people, community members. I I do a lot more of the reaching out than I actually get reached in because I know the barriers that our most marginalized people and general community um, don't necessarily have the power in Olympia as opposed to lobbyists. So I, I do spend a lot of time in the evenings and weekends reaching out and asking individual people who will be impacted by that policy their um, uh, you know, values or beliefs around that policy. So I have a different approach to co-sponsoring. I co-sponsor very few bills because the amount of time that it takes to understand something well enough is not worth the incremental value of my name on the bill. I take, I spend a lot more attention when it comes time to figure out whether you're going to vote for it or not, because often it's changed at that point. When it's something I'm prime sponsoring, it's a different deal. And most of the time, this comes from something locally. So the Public Broadband Act started years ago with conversations with Kitsap Public Utility District, where they, you know, I was, I mean, we had a Senator Rolfus and Representative Appleton, we were, I was shocked that there was a state law that barred them from serving the public with direct retail broadband. I mean, that's just appalling to me. And so, you know, that Sarah Rolfus kind of did some awesome work rolling part of that back. And then we got to take the big chunk of the pandemic because we had so many people just outraged at how bad broadband options were. Like nobody wants to pay Comcast a thousand gajillion dollars for spotty service when you might be able to have a public option. And so then, you know, the Suquamish tribe jumped right in from the very beginning. I mean, they were the anchor tenants of this locally. They were like, look, we're all in. We have a checkerboard reservation. There's spotty access here and there. Uh, we want to help this however we can. And so that, in any event, like that's, there. Are, I, I co-sponsor basically nothing. I prime sponsor very few bills, mostly because it takes so much time to kind of get your mind around something and do the kind of outreach you need to do to be sure you're pushing the right solution. So, And then I'll chip, I'll chime in. I will sponsor bills. I, I'm careful about what I sponsor, but usually every session I have one or two bills um, 
that come specifically from constituents who have contacted me and they have idea, they have identified problems and they have identified solutions and, um, or they've identified problems and together we found the solution. And so every year we have, a, I have a few of those that I'll sponsor. I mentioned the farmer's market and arts education earlier, um, but a different bill that I'm sponsoring this year is from a professional, um, a professional environmental um, person who's now retired, who lives in Polsbo. And he said, how come we don't have our water systems planning for climate change impacts? And we went through it and it turns out we're not. So that's a bill that is currently being heard in the house as well, that would require all the water systems of the state to identify what do we do with, how are we planning for aquifer reduction or drought or losing infrastructure to um, sea level rise in the next 20 or 30 years. So those are the kinds of bills I'll sponsor. And then I will co-sponsor bills that I've either been working on during the interim or over the last couple of years, but somebody else is taking the lead on, or I will put my name on bills that I didn't even know were gonna be introduced, but I see them, I talk to the sponsor and I know that the constituents um, that I work for um, have been asking for that kind of policy change. Um, so, and that whether that's staffing in hospitals or healthcare reform, um, I will um, lend my name and my support to those kinds of bills as well. But I'm probably more, I probably am right in the middle. I um, don't sign on to bills that I have, I don't know are a priority or that I don't have the time to really read and focus on. Excellent. Our next question comes from Fran. What is the likelihood that the House will pass the ban on high capacity magazines for assault weapons? Senate Bill 1876. Yeah. So it has already passed the Senate. The sensible measure looks promising to be convinced. Sure. So I'll take that one since that just came out of the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee yesterday. Uh, I support that just as background for way for people who may not know what we're talking about. Under federal law, there was a ban on magazines holding more than 10 rounds that was in effect from, I believe, 1994 to 2004 when it rolled off. Since then, a number of states have limited magazines of more than 10 rounds, or in some cases, more than 15 rounds, so that I think we have like 90 million or so Americans living in states that restrict magazine size uh, to 10 or fewer rounds. I mean, this is rough justice, but this is about right. It's happened in a number of other states. We have looked at versions of this in the past. The one that the Senate passed, that the House Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee passed yesterday, does not ban the possession of a magazine that holds over 10 rounds, but bans the manufacture, sale, and distribution of magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. That's a very different approach than California took, for example, which bans the possession as well as the manufacture, sale, and distribution. And for what it's worth, the full Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the constitutionality of California's, again, much stricter restriction just relatively recently, following other federal appeals courts, which I believe have unanimously upheld restrictions on magazine size. Now, again, we, we will see how this proceeds. Like, obviously, you know, anything can happen at a federal constitutional level. But we certainly feel comfortable as the law sits now that that's constitutional. And so that passed out of the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee. That should be headed to the House floor in the next week or two, because that's about all the time we have. And I would expect to vote for it again. Our next question comes to us from Ellen. I've been helping out the Bremerton Backpack Brigade, which provides food every Friday delivered through the Bremerton School District for more than 300 kids who would otherwise go hungry on the weekend. Given that child poverty is left back up following the lapse of the federal program, what actions are we taking as a state to help our most vulnerable citizens? I can start with that. It, I would say it has been a priority of the legislature, bipartisan priority of the legislature for years to work on child poverty issues. Um, we just, for example, um, the Senate just passed a bill over to the House that adds an allowance of, I'm gonna say $100 more a month to um, 
parents who are on the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families program, which is a, um, a work first kind of a program for family members. So the state provides support while the family member is looking for it, or the parent is looking for a job or going to college or going to school. And we just added money onto that for families, for every child younger than three, so that people could afford to buy diapers. And that passed the Senate by completely bipartisan and maybe with two crabby people voting no, um, but it was fundamentally unanimous in its support. We are um, investing this year in school nurses and counselors at the elementary, at all the schools, but with a focus on elementary schools because the state hasn't been providing that. And so levies have been paying for that. And in low income school districts, they don't even have school nurses. So um, food, behavioral health, the, um, there's a real focus right now in the legislature on children's mental health. And we are, in the Senate at least, we are supporting all of the recommendations that came out of the children's behavioral health workforce. Um, but the issue of child poverty is, um, it's one that we are focused on uh, to help reduce trauma to kids and lift their families out of poverty. Our next question comes from Eric. Uh, the Bremerton Ferry is often canceled. What's being done for constituents on weekends when the fast ferry isn't running and what are you doing to improve ferry reliability overall? Okay, I can do the overall general one. So look, we here's the problem. We have, I mean, it was the ferries have been horrible in the summers for a while, okay? And they became extra horrible last summer and fall. Generally speaking, there's three things going on. One is there's a global shortage of mariners. I mean, BC ferries is having, in British Columbia, is having the same problem we are. Number two, there was a wave of retirements last summer. We generally knew that the ferry fleet was aging, sorry, that the ferry workforce was aging. What we didn't predict was that people would just leave after about a year or so of dealing with COVID, which is totally, I mean, you get it, right? Like you've been going to work every day in person, COVID would rip through an engine room, flights, I mean, People understandably started retiring faster than we thought. And then third was the vaccine mandate. And I've forgotten the exact numbers, but it was something like 10% of the ferry workforce uh, that that was that either quit or retired or was, was separated from service because of that. So uh, all three of us spent a gigantic amount of time working with our constituent, uh, the governor, to figure out quickly like what we can do to put things in place to start to address this. And so the first thing that they did the first thing they did was change the memorandum of understanding with the unions to allow people who would who would normally be going and maintaining boats to go back and spot boats in service. So usually when your route goes out, when your boat goes out of service, you're on the maintenance group. Well, like there's an opportunity then to use people who are then doing maintenance to go backfill in areas that have shortages. That raises the question of who maintains the boats. But, you know, right now it's crisis situations, right? Like that's the first thing. Second thing, they've been recruiting year round, which they started doing earlier, uh, but have now amped up their recruiting efforts. Third thing is the package that we put together that we talked a little bit about, where we put a bunch of money from the operating budget into the transportation budget so that we don't have to raise gas taxes to pay for ferry improvements. If we push this through, this will be the best ferry package that we've had since I've been in the legislature. I mean, the last time we had a transportation package that raised the gas tax, I voted against it because it didn't do much for ferries. I mean, it put like eight, it put $800 million into one highway in Spokane, which was more than to put into the entire ferry system uh, for a 16 cent gas tax increase. And I voted against that because that was ridiculous. This is different. We're gonna, we have a decent level of ferry funding in this uh, that is not supported by a gas tax. So very much hoping to see that go through. And look, this is not great, right? I mean, this is still a crisis. This is still terrible. Like we, this is largely for better or for worse in the control of the executive because the ferry system is, is within the Department of Transportation. But from a funding perspective, like as a legislature, I mean, we organized pretty vigorously over last summer and fall with the plan that we need to have our voices heard and get ferries funded in the package. And so that should be happening. 
So I see Deborah McDaniel asked the question, when will service be restored to Bremerton? And I know that she was on our fairy town hall last fall when we all felt like this winter, we're going to get service back everywhere. We don't know the answer, Deborah. I talked to fairies this morning and they're hoping um, sometime this summer, but it's going to, it could, or, or sooner, but it could potentially be a long time. And so they are working right now with the unions on adding the late night seeing if we can get back the late night run um, so that there's better service in the evening. Um, Kids Up Transit remains a player. I don't know where that is going to pan out, um, but the ferry system has, they're going to release uh, their restoration plan in the next few weeks. And I think, I'm hopeful that Bremerton is going to move up the list for restoration services, but it, how we how we get the service delivered is and back on track is fully dependent on hiring and training people. And they've got a good, we, they just started a nationwide recruitment process where um, we know Alaska and BC are having the same labor shortage problems. We're competing with them. Um, they are, they are doing a much more focused approach to recruiting than has ever happened before, including going to high schools and talking to kids about maritime, um, maritime careers, which is a longer term solution, but it's part of the solution. And they're just, I know folks want um, heads to roll. And if fairies were sitting by and not doing anything, uh, there may, there, you might be able to identify heads that should roll, but they're really going all out trying to meet this labor crisis. And um, I'm supportive of the efforts that they're going through right now. Our next question comes to us from Steve. Uh, will you support safe staffing standards for nurses and healthcare workers? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I, I will say, you know, this bill is, you know, I, I co-sponsor a lot of bills to raise conversations and, and you know, follow ones more closely depend, along the process. This is one of my favorite bills that I am a co-sponsor of. Um, I am a former nurse. I know how difficult it was when times when we had, um, you know, um, conditions that were unsustainable. I also know that we are losing nurses right now and healthcare workers because of the conditions of our, uh, what we're asking them to do is putting their license at risk, but more importantly, it's putting our patients at risk. Um, you know, recently, uh, one of our dear beloved constituents who is a member of the North Kitsap um, Paulsville Rotary Club uh, posted in Community Help on Facebook that she was in the emergency room at our local hospital and she hadn't seen her nurse for four hours and she needed a bedpan and they didn't give her a, a call light. And that is um, egregious to me. And it stems from not having enough workers in our hospitals and having extremely high patient ratios. And this is a priority for me personally now. I'm, um, I really hope that this bill gets to the governor's desk. And it's not very often that I go over the virtual rotunda to the Senate to make my concerns known and my advocacy known, but I am on this bill because it means that much to me personally as a former nurse and to our community. So I am all in this bill, better make it to the governor's desk. <laughs> and it's in the Senate right now and I don't know why I wouldn't support it, so. We'll yeah, see. Vice Chair Sen and I both voted for it. So, you know, unanimity on this. Excellent. Our next question comes to us from MK Gale 13. What is the legislature doing to protect our near shore habitat for forage fish, salmon, and orcas, such as protecting eelgrass? I can take this one. <laughs> So we have, a, we have a couple of Senate bills that we are sending over to, um, to Representatives Hansen and Simmons. One of them is a, a Department of Natural Resources request legislation that focuses on restoring kelp, bed, kelp, kelp beds and eelgrass meadows. It probably had the best title of any bill that we talked about this year. It is a mapping exercise and then a restoration followed by, up by a restoration plan and the funding will follow if the legislature thinks the plan is good. And then the second thing we're doing is we have put in place different standards for shoreline development um, over the last couple of years and with Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Ecology helping local governments 
with their permitting so as to reduce damage to the shorelines of Puget Sound. So it's it's called death by a thousand cuts, right? Um, every every dock or bulkhead that gets rebuilt or removed um, is, is a point of discussion. So what the state is doing now is working with local governments on if you need your bulkhead replaced, how can it be replaced in a more environmentally sensitive way? Or does it need to be replaced? Can we do something different with your property? So those kinds of um, permitting changes are, if they're not at local government planning departments right now, they're coming. Excellent. Our next question is from Susan. Um, what updates in legislation can you give that support mental health in schools? So I can take first crack at this one. We just passed a bill out of the house to dramatically increase funding for nurses and counselors in schools. By dramatically, I mean $700 million over two years. Like uh, it's a lot of money to put nurses and counselors in schools, but you need it, right? I mean, you like, I mean, you can't really have a functioning school in this day and age without some access to mental health support, a nurse, a counselor, you know, whatever that looks like in each individual district. So that's the most significant thing we're doing. I mean, I think like more generally, look, this is not a great time for mental health for young people and even not so young people in this state or in this country. And what's gonna make a big difference is getting through this pandemic. And it's not like just remote school versus not remote school or mass versus not mass. I mean, no matter what state you're in, people are not doing great, right? You can be in a red state or a blue state, a state with no mass in schools, state with mass in schools. This has been hard. OK, and until we kind of get through the end of this, it's going to continue to be hard. And so that's where, you know, look like I'm hopeful we're on the back end of this pandemic from the last two years. And so that we can all just kind of reset a little bit and kind of keep ourselves together. But, yeah, from a legislative perspective, that's the main thing we're doing is just trying to get nurses and counselors in more schools. Yeah, and I'll just say, um, you know, as somebody who sits on the Public Safety Committee, you know, the school to prison pipeline is real and we've been working on it for many years. And this is an investment that will make our community safer. When youth have access to supportive services, they're less likely to engage in um, behavior that will have them end up in juvenile detention. They are more less likely to engage in substance use um, issues. And so this is a huge preventative measure that will help us with our public safety issues that we're facing today too. So I'm in full support and really grateful for the prime sponsor in our legislature for prioritizing that this year. Uh, our next question uh, comes to us uh, from Christine regarding ferries, going back to just hit on the ferries again. Washington State Ferries claims that they do not have a sufficient number of ferries to both meet peak demand and ferry maintenance schedules. What can you, the legislature, do to delay removal of critical jumbo ferries for conversion to hybrid propulsion until we have either new ferries in service or reactivation of recently laid up ferries? That's a that's actually a good question. I don't. I ha would have to think that state ferries has a plan. So all of the ferries get pulled out of the um, system for annual or regular maintenance. And it's my assumption that they would, when they're pulled out for their regular on the regular maintenance schedule, usually in the fall and winter when we don't need all of the ferries on the water, that that's when they would um, get the engine transplant essentially. Um, but we can check into that and make sure that that's the case. Yeah, and I think to, that, that I think that Senator Rolfs is right. That's generally the case. Like the reason we're having ferry cancellations is mostly because of staffing issues. It's not because of boat issues. From time to time, it does happen because of boat issues, but it's mostly a staffing problem. The transportation package we talked about does have money for more boats, and we're going to be amending that to make sure everyone knows. Kind of the plan is to continue building more boats on a regular schedule, hybrid electric boats, so they're not polluting boats, but just you know we got to like you got to replace that fleet. Right? Right? I mean, it's not like a bridge where it's going to be good for 90 years or whatever. Like, you have to replace that fleet as it goes forward. Excellent. Our next question comes from 
uh, Mr. Woods, what bills will address global warming and climate change this session? There's a lot. We did, we did some fundamental big picture bills last year and instituted a statewide cap and trade program. So there are bills coming through this year that build off of that, kind of fine tune that, make sure that industries that will be subject to that, um, to those rules have support that they need to uh, transition to cleaner fuels. Um, but that was, our big move was last year. This year we have bills that um, we're sending over or that the house is sending over related to incentives for purchasing electric vehicles, uh, in tax incentives for solar power to, for communities, not for homeowners, but for community organizations and um, public entities to get more solar power deployed. We just heard a really interesting bill that would be tax break to get so what's called solar canopies and parking lots like you see in other states. We just don't have those around here. Um, that, would, that would be pretty meaningful in Eastern Washington in terms of renewable energy. And then we're doing a lot, probably I would say in the budget uh, related to climate change, um, planting trees, protecting salmon from climate change, things like that, that are not stopping climate pollution necessarily, but that are addressing the change that's happening and hoping to sustain our natural resources um, while the climate change is happening. The other, the other thing it really is the transportation budget that we just passed. So electrifying the ferry system. Ferry system is the biggest state polluter um, the biggest polluter in state government. And so when we can do clean fuels, hybrids, electric ferries, that's huge. And then a lot of what's in the transportation budget related to transit and making it safer for people to walk and ride their bicycles. There's a lot in there that directly um, is intended to reduce climate pollution. Yeah, and we just sent over, um, you know, about 10 bills to the Senate addressing climate change as well. They're not as um, expansive as last year, but some of them, um, <coughs> excuse me, deal with the appliance efficiency standards, um, energy codes for in buildings. Um, <coughs> one in particular I really love is Rep Hackney's that's going to allow for um, energy uh plug-in devices in homeowner uh, associations and um, apartment units and things like that. So we are making smaller um, progress this session, but really building upon what we did last year and also in our transportation package, there's a lot there. All right, fantastic. Our next question comes to us from Martha. Thank you for also, thank you so much for all your hard work and all your thoughtful efforts in helping those farthest from opportunity. What investments is the Senate planning in early learning? I'll take that. The, um, the Senate budget will be out in the morning on Monday. So the specific investments will be, will be public at that time. We made, we passed, the legislature passed last year, what we call the Fair Start Act, which was an enormous statewide investment in child care and early learning programs. And we funded that bill to be phased in. And so what we will prob what you will probably see on Monday uh, is follow up to that. So there is a plan and we'll be um, supporting funding for the plan that we adopted last year. Excellent, our next. A uh, question comes to us from Christopher. What are your thoughts on whole Washington, Senate Bill 5204 and Initiative 1362? Those are all whole Washington, to be clear. Yeah, I'll start with that. Um, you know, I am a person who strongly believes in universal health care. I think that countries that have universal health care for their citizens are healthier places. Um, and so I will support any efforts to make that happen. However, I am not necessarily in the weeds on the current bill before the legislature, which I think is dead now. 
Uh, I think there needs to be a lot more work done. And I really look to the leadership of Senator Randall, who is on the Universal Task Force um, and is um, really invested and we share values of creating that pathway. And so I can't speak to the actual bill, but I can speak to my values of wanting to see every single person in our community have um, affordable or even free healthcare. If we can ever get there in this country, I think that would be amazing. And so I'm gonna support every effort to do that. Our next question comes to us from Susan. Uh, what is happening to the COLA for Plan 1 retired teachers? The, uh, the, House, the Senate passed the bill over to the House, I believe. That we, did, we did the same thing, so, yeah, uh, so there's going to be good. <laughs> it's looking It's looking highly likely that that yeah. COLA will be in the budget. All right. Well, that is just about all the time we have. We are going to give uh, the representatives and senator time to make some closing remarks. Um, Representative Hanson, if you would like to take us away. Yeah, no, thanks so much for doing this, everyone. And thanks to our staff for doing a great job moderating. We've had questions coming in on Facebook, multiple Facebook pages, YouTube, the chat here in the Zoom some by email. So the staff has been trying to, you know, say, we can't answer everything, but like we have thousands of questions on fairies. Okay, here's a couple of fairy questions, thousands of questions on mental health in schools. Here's how we do it. So I'm really grateful for this format. I mean, I noticed some people in the Zoom chat saying, look, this is great, right? Like when you go back to in-person town halls, maybe you can do this too. I want to, I mean, I hope we can figure out a way to do that. Like it's something we really noticed in the legislature when we had to go remote it's not great, but it has some benefits. Like I had someone in my committee testify from Spokane, the Spokane City Council president. In the old times, this would have been a day if this guy could even get over the past to kind of get over, testify, get back. We allowed him to just kind of zoom in and testify remotely uh, for a couple minutes. It was fantastic. You know, same thing for people who have disabilities, people who have childcare issues, people who got work schedules. Like some of this remote stuff really works. And we need, one of the things we need to do as God willing, we roll out of the pandemic is hold on to some of this, the accessibility benefits that it gives to people. So, I mean, I don't, that, that's all I got by way of closes, just to thank you all for taking the time to do this. We look forward to seeing you again in person as soon as we can. And I, I do hope we continue doing the remote option as well, because it's a lot easier for people for whom, you know, it's kind of a big deal to drive to the Eagle's Nest and eat our donuts and drink our coffee and drive back. I don't have that kind of time. So appreciate y'all. Thanks for giving us the chance to do this. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback and say it is truly an honor to serve you all. And I try to listen and, and read as much email as I can. It's We've gotten a lot of email uh, lately, and I'm, I'm really grateful when you do take the time to email me and share your perspective around a particular bill. I try my best to reach out and, and ask that, but sometimes we don't have time. And so this town hall is, is a really great way to hear from you, and I really thank you for, for joining today, and thank you for the honor to serve. Um, I, I think I'm bringing a unique perspective to the legislature that's not ever been represented, and I am honored to have that opportunity to really amplify the voices of people who have struggled in many ways, who've been in poverty, who've um, been involved in the criminal justice system, but also the opportunity to learn and meet new friends who have not come from that background and hear your perspectives and, and really be part of this policy sausage making process um, to serve the people of the 23rd from Bainbridge Island down here to East Bremerton. It is truly an honor and I am so grateful for each and every one of you, even if we disagree sometimes on a particular policy, that is okay. And I love hearing dissenting views and, and really trying to do my best to thread the needle to make everybody happy. Um, so thank you for joining today. Thank you for the honor of serving you. And I will wrap it up. There have been a couple of questions in the chat about how many people are on this call. We know that there are about 200 people right now that were um, either on the call or on the active in other forums. The And so I just want to thank you all. I don't have a, a, anything to add to Drew and Tara's points about this being a wonderful forum in many ways. There is was a question posed about how to get in touch with us. 
Um, starting after legislative session, I am happy to meet with people over a cup of coffee or in small groups. Um, but for now, email and phone calls still are the best way to work. And we should be done in Olympia by the second week of March. Um, so with that, thank you guys. Thank you all very much. Drew and Tara, I love working with you. It is a pleasure to do a town hall with you. And to our staff, um, Chris and Peter and Travis and Jennifer, and I probably left somebody off, Zach. Thank you guys for Audrey. being behind. Audrey, <laughs> Lily, thank you guys for being behind the scenes and helping monitoring all the questions that are going in and setting this meeting up for us. Um, so everybody have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone.